July 8, 1966. On the plane from New Delhi to London, the Beatles tell Brian Epstein their decision to stop touring. After the American part of the present tour was over, they did not want to go out on the road again, at least in the foreseeable future. This upset Brian so much that by the time the jet reached Heathrow Airport, his body was covered with hives and welts in an almost uninterrupted pattern. What will I do if they stop touring? What will be left for me? Brian had more exciting options open to him than almost any man in show business, but without the Beatles to actively consume his time, he saw nothing ahead of him. The decision to stop touring was an enormous blow. You know, I think it was George and John who were particularly against it, uh, particularly got fed up. We might have been waxworks for all, for all, you know, what the good we did there. You know, nobody heard anything. He found himself flooded with ideas from people who knew what the Beatles should do next instead of touring. Many of these people were would-be managers, circling Brian like sharks in the water, waiting for the right moment to come up and take a bite. The most aggressive of these was a man named Alan Klein. Um, Paul McCartney had a very low opinion of Alan Klein. Yeah, out there, that this isn't a person to be trusted. Well, Mr. Klein's contracts are amazing. Klein was a fast-talking, dirty-mouthed man in his early 30s, sloppily dressed and grossly overweight. Brian had met him previously in 1964, when Klein was managing American R&B singer Sam Cooke. Klein came to see Brian at his Argyle Street offices to discuss the possibility of Cooke's opening for the next American Beatles tour, but soon engaged him in another conversation. I heard the Beatles royalty rates from EMI were shit. I could renegotiate their contracts. A million pounds guaranteed against 10% of their royalties. Brian was royally offended at the suggestion that someone else should do his job for him, and he had Klein shown to the door. In 1965, Klein had taken over the management of the Rolling Stones. In a splashy move that was reported in all the papers, Klein renegotiated the Stones' recording contracts with Decca and got them a £1 million advance, a highly publicized figure that Brian found himself having to live down. And Alan Klein began to develop this reputation as being the guy who could go in on behalf of an artist and get them their money. When Paul McCartney was asked what moment with Brian he regretted the most, he said it was in a crowded elevator with the other Beatles when he said to Brian, Yeah, well, Klein got the stones a million and a quarter, didn't he? What about us? To make Brian's paranoia even worse, Klein gave an interview in the winter of 67, in which he said he would get the Beatles. So many rumors followed his announcement, which alleged that Alan Klein would merge with NIMS, that Brian finally issued a formal statement to the press, discounting Klein's claims as ridiculous and rubbish. But in his heart, Brian was scared. First of all, he had not told the boys about his plans to sell the controlling share of NIMS to Robert Stigwood, best known for managing Crane and the BGs. Secondly, he was worried by what he saw as signs of the Beatles' growing discontent. They were beginning to learn that Brian was unable to get out of bed until 5 o'clock in the afternoon because of the huge amounts of barbiturates in his system. He was scared most, however, because unknown to almost everyone, the Beatles' management contracts with Brian were up in the fall of 67. That was the love of Brian's life. That was more than anything what Brian wanted in his whole life. The Beatles were his life. I don't think that he could conceive of a life without them, and that became a big problem for him. When we actually uh, did finish touring, I suppose Brian felt uh, his role was decreasing, and I think that was a sadness to him. I think that actually was what was happening. I think the problem was we were starting to feel we didn't really need much management. We are now in the studio making Sergeant Pepper. The possibility always lurked that the boys would take one of the many other offers to heart. So, without telling them, he renegotiated their recording contracts with EMI, which were up at the end of 1967. Brian had written into the contracts a clause wherein NIMS would collect all monies due to the Beatles, from which Brian would deduct his 25%. However, these EMI contracts ran for nine years, a full eight years past the duration of Brian's management contracts. Now, even if they had fired him, he would continue to collect record royalties. Brian never pointed this clause out to them. I don't know, they're talking about the conditions. We said, well, let's just get this straight. We're not going to be sold to anyone. 
we, if you can, you, have, you can continue to manage us, we love you, we're not going to be sold. He said, in fact, if you do, if you somehow manage to pull this off, or someone has a, a trick here, he said, we can promise you one thing. We will record God Save the Queen for every single record we make from now on, and we'll sing it out of tune. That is a promise. It must have seemed to Brian that whatever hold he had on those around him was slipping. That July, his father died of a heart attack while away on vacation in Bournemouth. He returned to Liverpool to be with his mother Queenie for the funeral. On August 14th, Queenie arrived in London to stay with Brian at Chapel Street, and an immediate change came over him. Queenie woke him each morning by pulling back the drapes to let the sun in. They ate breakfast together while discussing his plans for the day. He went to the office every day and worked diligently. At night, he took Queenie to the theater or a restaurant. His use of barbiturates was discreet, and he didn't seem to let it interfere with his work or sleep. He was clearly a man more in control of himself, and his close friends felt a sense of relief. But unfortunately, this didn't last for too long. On August 24th, Queenie left London. As Queenie sat in the train on the way home to Liverpool, the Beatles were on their way to Bangor, Northwest Wales, in Maharishi's meditation course. Well, can you tell me, do you take it seriously, this cult? Uh, cult? I wouldn't call it a cult, and of course we take it seriously. We wouldn't be sitting here, mm. would we? You know, it's, it's only you that isn't taking it seriously. Everybody else here is. So. <laughs> Encouraged by the Maharishi, the Beatles made a startling announcement. They were giving up drugs. They explained it was impossible to achieve spiritual harmony with foreign substances in one system, and since they wanted to give the Maharishi a fair shake, they were giving it all up. But Brian had not given up drugs. I hope I'm not asking for too many things, but I'm anxious for this to be a good trip for us both. Till the second, love, flowers, bells, be happy, and look forward to the future with love, Brian. This was the last letter that Brian had written me, which was written three days before he died. John, where would you be today without Mr. Epstein? I don't know. Are you, are you driving down to London tonight? Yes, somebody's taking us down here. You heard the news this afternoon, I believe. Yes. And Paul's already gone down? Yes. I see. What, you've no idea what your plans are for tomorrow? No, no, we'd just go and find out, you know. And what is it? What does it mean, you know? Our friend is gone, you know? Uh, more our friend than anything else, you know, Brian was a friend of ours. In Monte Carlo, Robert Stigwood was on a yacht he had rented for the BGs, who were celebrating the end of work on their first album. His assistant came running down the pier screaming, Brian's dead! It turned out they wouldn't have to make the 500,000 pound option in just a few days after all. The Beatles and Nims could be all theirs. In New York City, Alan Klein was driving across the George Washington Bridge to his home in New Jersey. Behind him, Manhattan was glittering like a diamond diorama. Just then, there was a news flash on the radio. Brian Epstein was dead. Klein snapped his fingers. I got them! I, d I knew that we were in trouble then. I had never, I didn't really have any misconceptions about our ability to do anything other than play music. And uh, I was scared, you know, I thought we fucking had it now. No one could possibly replace Brian, was what Paul McCartney kept saying. Except perhaps, Paul himself. On September 2nd, 1967, only six days after Brian Epstein's death, Paul took the reins and set them off at a wild gallop. 
But Paul made an attempt to carry on as if Brian hadn't died, you know, by saying, now, now, boys, we're going to make a record. He set up a meeting with all the Beatles in his house to discuss their next project. Paul's idea was to write on with the Magical Mystery Tour that he dreamed up on the plane coming home from America. The project was to be recorded, produced, scripted, directed, and edited by the Beatles, namely Paul. Or something like that. The Magical Mystery Tour was another where he'd set it up, you know, and then, then he did worked it out with Mal, and then he came and showed me what his idea was, and this is how it went. It went around like this, the story, and had it all, you know, I think, production and... A formal script was never prepared for the project. Instead, only an outline, sketches of dwarfs and rewarmed Fellini characters out of Paul's comic strip imagination. I ended up kind of directing it, even though we said, well, the Beatles are directed at the end. Just because I was there most of the time in all the late night chats with the cameraman about what we're going to do tomorrow would tend to be me rather than the others. If Brian had been there, it never would have happened the way it did. On September 11th, a 60-seat yellow and blue coach festooned with signs that identified as the Magical Mystery Tour took off for Devon and Cornwall with a cast and crew of 43 aboard. Following them was a procession of carloads of Fleet Street reporters, plus 10 or 15 fans in their own cars. The Mystery Tour stopped in Devon, where they hoped to find the Devon Fair, but found only a town. At Tegan, the local constable chased them on for disturbing the peace. When they stopped for a lunch break, they discovered they were 30 lunches short to feed the cast and crew. The first night on the road, the sleeping accommodations had been underbooked, and Paul and Neil Aspinall spent hours sorting out fights between fat ladies and dwarfs who didn't want to share rooms. Heading north the next day, their caravan caused mayhem and traffic jams wherever they went, not just because of the cars that followed them, but because a line of cars now preceded them for a mile. Unable to take another second of it, John ordered the bus to stop, stormed out the door, and ripped the signs from the sides of the coach in a fury. And then we were all, George and I were sort of grumbling, you know, fucking movie, you know, well, we better do it, you know, a feeling that we, we owed the public or owed somebody other that we should do these things, you know. So we made it, you know. We knew we weren't doing a regular film. We were doing a crazy, roly-poly 60s film. We, I am the Eggman, you were the... Each Beatle had a say about the film, and it was edited and re-edited and tinkered with a thousand times. Often it was changed back and forth four times in the same day, with Paul countermanding John's suggestion of that very morning. One day, Peter Brown received a phone call in his office on the Beatles' private line. It was Paul. Where are you? Peter asked. I'm in Nice, France, with the camera crew. We found the perfect hill, but we haven't brought the right lenses. Do you think you could have them shipped out to us, along with some money? You know, and I just wandered off to France and did that, um, Fool on the Hill stuff. Peter was baffled. France? Perfect Hill? What are you talking about? How can you be in France? I have your passport. Paul explained he wanted to include a scene in the film of him staying on a picturesque hill, singing The Fool on the Hill. He took off for France without telling anybody, and bluffed his way past the English authorities at Heathrow, saying his passport was waiting for him France. By the time Paul and crew returned to London, it had cost £4,000 just for the shot of him sitting on the hill. I mean, the scene that to me that stands out is the one of John shoveling the spaghetti onto the fat woman's plate. Uh, I mean, that was the best bit of the movie for me. All this mud in 45 minutes. I can hardly get my breath. That was an actual dream he'd had. And so he'd come in, you know, and he'd sort of say, hey, I had this wild dream last night. I'd like to do it. I'm a waiter. You know, and so we just put them in, you know, and... Uh, it was very haphazard, you know, looking back on it, it's how you learn kind of thing, by your mistakes, you know. But I think, you know, in the end, it came out, I think it's quite interesting now, looking back on it as a period piece. And people like Spielberg, I've read that people like him have sort of said, when I was in film school, we re that was a film we really took notice of. Like an art film, you know, rather than a proper film. But of course, we then released it. When Magical Mystery Tour was officially finished, Paul screened it for everyone at NAMS. The reaction was unanimous, it was awful. It was formless, disconnected, disjointed, and amateurish. Peter told Paul to junk it. So what? We lost 40,000 pounds, he said. Better to junk it than be embarrassed by it. But Paul's ego wouldn't let him consider this. 
He was positive that the film would be warmly greeted by the public as all the Beatles products that came before it. Reluctantly, the rights were sold to the BBC, who put it on air on December 26th, Boxing Day in England, when millions of Britons were at home celebrating the holidays. Talk about your magical mysteries. I spent half an hour looking for that sugar, I tell you. Any news of the bus? The bus. It's ten miles north on the Dewsbury Road. Great. And they're having a lovely time. <laughs> they're having a lovely time! They're having a lovely time! And, of course, they showed it in black and white. And so it was hated. You know, they all had their chance then to say they've gone too far. Who do they think they are? What does it mean? The critical reaction was truly remarkable. The press was so unaccountably mean and vindictive that for the first time in memory, an artist felt he had to make a public apology for his work. In an effort to explain the group's creation, Paul McCartney gave a television interview to David Frost. Good evening, Mr. Frost. Good evening, Mr. McCartney. Uh, why don't you think that the critics like this film? I don't know, you know. They just didn't seem to like it. I, I quite liked it. myself. Well, I liked it. I, I saw it. I didn't see it last night because I was a bit busy, but I saw it today, and uh, and and I liked it, I mean, with reservations and so on. But I mean, why were people so puzzled by it? Do you think? I think they thought it was bitty, which it was a bit, you know. But it was supposed to be like that. I think a lot of people were looking for a plot, and there wasn't one. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought that we could just do a thing. You see, we've been waiting for a couple of years now to make a, another feature film. And we've been asking people to write stories and write plots, in fact, targets. But uh, nobody's come up with one, you know. So we thought we would do something which isn't like that, you know, which isn't like a real film in as much as it's got a story and a beginning. We'll just do a selection of, you know, we put together a lot of things that we like to look on and see what happens. Did you have a point in mind when you, I mean, some... I mean, some point to get across at all is it when you do this? No, see, that's the trouble. It, it seems that you've got to do everything with a point or an aim, but we tried this one without anything, you know, with no point, no aim. It's like, you know, we make a, a record album, and all the songs don't necessarily have to fit in with each, one, each other, you know. They're just a, a selection of songs. But when you come to making a film, I don't know, you seem to have to have a, a thread to pull it all together. But we thought that doing a mystery tour you know, it all happens on a bus to this group of people, would be enough of a threat. And then calling it a magical mystery tour, which like a firm advertises a magical mystery tour, and you go on it, and it really is magic, then anything might happen there, and it wouldn't have a threat if it was magic. Is the fact that it didn't get across to a lot of people, does that fact alter your opinion of it? Do you say, right, it seems to have failed, or do you still think it's precisely as good as if people had said it was very good? Now, yeah, I think it's as good, you know, as I always thought it was. But I, when we were making it, I think all of us thought, well, this has got a very thin plot. You know, we hope this idea of doing a thing without a plot works. Because the one thing we're going to be able to say is it hasn't got a plot. But, yeah, we thought, you don't need a plot. You don't always need one. You know, because, like, the things you did today probably didn't have much of a plot. So, oh, I was plotting all day. Yeah. <laughs> In February 1968, the Beatles intended to complete the Transcendental Meditation course they had begun the previous August in Bangor, North Wales, just as Apple Corps was about to get going. But this time, the Beatles agreed to go off Rishikesh in the remote wilderness of North India for three months of serious study rather than just a 10-day course. They hoped that mastering Transcendental Meditation would give them the wisdom to run Apple. They planned to live in an ashram in Rishikesh, free of drugs and alcohol. Far from the noise and pace of city life in the cool, clear air of Rishikesh, North India, Pathy News reports from the meditation retreat of Maharishi Maharishi Yogi, the man who, through transcendental meditation, is currently bringing peace of mind to the Beatles. The Beatles' belief in the tiny Maharishi appeared unshakable. Throughout the winter, they remained devout followers of the Guru, paying frequent visits to his London home in South Kensington. They continued to attend his lectures, and George and John became vegetarians, though John almost immediately resumed his drug regimen after Brian Epstein's death. The Beatles were even considering financing a major motion picture about the Maharishi through an offshoot of Apple Films. 
The proceeds would go toward establishing a transcendental meditation university in London. Peter Brown, the Beatles' personal assistant, stated, I had my doubts about the efficacy of the Beatles going off to India with the Maharishi, in the middle of formation of Apple, particularly because of certain incidents that led me to believe that Maharishi was using the Beatles' name for his personal gain. Peter received a phone call one day from the lawyers for ABC Television in America. They claimed the Maharishi had been negotiating a TV special with them, which he claimed would include an appearance by the Beatles. The Beatles' cooperation was being confirmed by ABC's lawyers, who were calling Peter. He informed them that the Beatles had no plans to appear on the Maharishi's show. Only a week later, the lawyers were calling again, and the Maharishi insisted on delivering them. I called the Maharishi in Malmo, Sweden, where he was lecturing at the moment, and explained the problem to him, but his answers were obscure and indefinite. I decided to fly to Malmo, with Paul and George in tow, to insist he not represent the Beatles as being part of his projects. They met the Maharishi and tried to explain to him that he could not use their names to exploit his business affairs and that they would not appear on his TV special, but the Maharishi simply nodded and giggled as they laid down the law. He's not a modern man, George admitted on the plane home. He simply does not grasp these concepts. This is what happens in transcendental meditation. The surface activity of the conscious mind deepens and incorporates within its fold the depth of the subconscious. The Beatles left for Rishikesh on February 16th. John and Cynthia, George and Patty, Paul and Jane Asher, Ringo and Maureen, Jenny Boyd, Donovan and Mal Evans made up the traveling party. They arrived in Delhi by jet, then by taxi and jeep, and finally on the backs of donkeys. When the road became impassable for the donkeys, they walked the last half mile, crossing a narrow road bridge over a muddy chasm before reaching the ashram's gates. The Beatles were cut off from the rest of the world for the first time in years. The lack of information about what was going on in the ashram piqued the public's interest. The entire world seemed to know that the Beatles had gone to India to discover the truth, and millions waited for them to return and spread the word. Among the guests at the ashram were Beach Boy Mike Love, jazz musician Paul Horn, American actress Mia Farrow, 20 other unrecognized pupils, a variety of disgruntled Californian Americans, and some elderly Swedish widows. In contrast to the Beatles' expectations, the ashram turned out to be more like a hotel than a Spartan guru camp. It was very much like a kind of summer camp. You would get up in the morning, you would go down to a little communal breakfast. Food was veggie, which is kind of good for me now, but thinking back on it, it was, I was still meat eating then, so it was, it was all right though, it was sort of curries and stuff, you know. Rishikesh is an incredible place. Um, it's like 99% of the population of Rishikesh are all renunciates. It's right in the foothills of the Himalayas. It's where the Ganges flows out of the Himalayas into the plains of Kurukshetra. It's called the plains between Delhi and the Himalayas. I mean, we were really away from everything. It was like a sort of recluse holiday camp. The lodgings were in a collection of charming stone bungalows, each with four or five bedrooms. Under a vine-covered trellis near to the Ganges, long, hand-carved tables were used for community dining. A vast number of servants provided them with food, which was cooked in a fully contemporary kitchen by a chef. At short distance from the rest of the compound, the Maharishi's house was a long, low, modern structure with its own kitchen and staff. There was even a woman to give the girls a daily massage. The most eyebrow-raising of all the luxury accoutrements was the landing pad for the helicopter used to ferry the Maharishi in and out of the compound on his appointed rounds throughout India. This was the man whom George had excused as, quote, not a modern man. They started studying seriously after getting situated in the ashram. Each morning, they rose early for breakfast, attended lengthy lectures, and then spent the afternoons in meditation sessions. They began a friendly competition to see who could meditate the longest, and every night at supper, they had spirited discussions about who was getting it and who wasn't. Some believed that John was acting, and that George was the group member who was the most open to spirituality. Although they had cut their mustaches just before the trip, they wore traditional Indian clothes and allowed their hair to grow. Without the aid of drugs or alcohol, the boys would play their guitars outside in the moonlight after dinner every night and sing and compose songs. The quantity and quality of the songs composed in India was staggering, even to those who knew them, 
The following album would consist of 30 of the tracks. When we sat in the mountains eating lousy vegetarian food and writing all those songs, you know, wrote tons of songs in India. Paul came down with his acoustic guitar playing, flew in from Miami Beach to the OAC, didn't get to bed last night. I said, wow, that's pretty cool, that's neat. He says, yeah, it's sort of like a, a Beach Boy style, but... You know. <laughs> the muse appeared to have impacted everyone in the compound. Donovan wrote his beautiful Jennifer Juniper for Patty Harrison's sister, Jenny. The Beatles may have enjoyed the nicest birthday party in a while at George's 24th birthday celebration when the Maharishi gave him a seven pound cake and fireworks show. The atmosphere was loving and mellow. Cynthia had been hurt to find that John had made arrangements for them to sleep in separate apartments when they initially got to the ashram. John argued that the separation would be beneficial for meditation and that in any case, they would continuously be in view of one another in the cramped camp. Cynthia enjoyed staying in Rishikesh, despite the unromantic situation. Her last ditch attempt to save their marriage was the Maharishi retreat. Her relationship with John was in ruins. A little Japanese woman named Yoko Ono had recently come to Cynthia's attention as a presence in their lives. She seemed to be everywhere, whether she was sitting in the back seat of the car or waiting for them in front of the house. Her tiny book of how-to poems was mysteriously left on the nightstand on John's side of the bed. Even though John repeatedly assured Cynthia that he had no romantic feelings for her, Cynthia was just as happy to have him away from drug dealers as she was from Yoko Ono. The fact that she was around. Just instinct, pure instinct. Cynthia had no idea that John had thought about taking Yoko to India instead of her, or perhaps in addition to her, if he could have managed it. I was going to take her, but I, I, back, I lost my nerve because I was going to take my wife and Yoko, and I didn't know how to work it, you know. Going to Rishikesh with Yoko would have been a lot more enjoyable for John. Because he hadn't lied to Cynthia, he didn't feel bad about Yoko. It was not a romantic relationship, it was an intellectual one. His titillation was caused by Yoko's grating wit and mild madness. She was a grateful diversion from Cynthia's cloying kindness because she was intelligent and opinionated. Cynthia would look up to John with those blue believing eyes whenever John was about to tell her their marriage was gone and he never had the heart. As Yoko excitedly awaited John's arrival, Cynthia had a chance to rediscover her identity in Rishikesh. After some introspection, she painted and drew for hours. She kept a safe distance as John improved in health and strength. Maharishi even succeeded for a little period in eliciting some upbeat sounds from John. Julian, who was staying with Lillian Powell and Mrs. Jarlett while they were away, would be turning five in a few weeks, Cynthia and John had informed the Maharishi. The following week, they were asked to the Maharishi's house where they were presented with a made-to-order wardrobe for Julian befitting an Indian prince. John was filled with warm, paternal feelings. But the brief warmth soon dissipated, and John started to slip away from her. He occasionally avoided her for days, even in the little ashram. He remained in his room alone for an increasing amount of time. Cynthia assumed he was meditating. Not at all. He was writing long, rambling letters to a Japanese artist who was waiting for him in London. Each morning, he rose early and went to the mailbox to collect letters from Yoko. She instructed him in a letter. Look up at the sky, and when you see a cloud, think of me. I was so enthused about the letters, John said. Nothing in them could have been comprehended by spouses or mothers-in-law, and after visiting India, I began to consider her a full-fledged woman rather than just an intellectual. Ringo and Maureen left on the tenth day. They told the reporters they had to leave because Ringo's delicate stomach couldn't take the spicy food, but it was because they hated the ashram. The food was, was impossible for me because, you know, I'm allergic to so many, so many different things. So I took two suitcases with me, one of clothes and one of Heinz beans. There's a plug for you. The clincher was Maureen's aversion to flying insects. The banks of the Ganges are not a good place to visit if one is afraid of flying insects. Each night, Maureen would make Richie kill every fly in the room and dispose of the carcasses. Paul and Jane persevered through six weeks. I was thinking of going back, you know. But at the end of my months, I was quite happy and I thought, this will do me. Paul just wasn't understanding it or believing it. The mock seriousness of the Maharishi and the tediousness of meditation were too much like school for him. Paul and Jane were too sophisticated for the mystical gibberish. 
However, none of this was mentioned when they saw the media. All they stated was that they missed London and were eager to return home. However, despite the rising suspicion of their friends, including Neil Aspinall, John and George persisted in their faith. I didn't come back um, with the others anyway. I don't recall. I think Ringo probably came back quickly. He just went for a couple of weeks, just like, just to put his toe in the water and see what it was like, maybe. Uh, and Paul just came and, and went. We were there four months, or George and I were. No, we lost 13 pounds and we looked a day older. Neil was regularly flying from London to the ashram where he updated the Beatles on Apple's development. One of these trips concerned making a deal with the Maharishi for a film about him. Neil was surprised to learn that the Maharishi had a full-time accountant on staff, as he had anticipated having trouble explaining the financial arrangements to the spiritual leader. For a long while, Neil and the guru haggled over an additional two and a half points. Neil thought, This Maharishi knows more about making deals than I do. He's really into scoring. Magic Alex, head of Apple Electronics, turned out to be Maharishi's most powerful critic. John, who missed having Alex around, invited him to Rishikesh. Alex was horrified by what he discovered when he arrived at the ashram. A four-poster bed ashram with masseuses, water-bringing maids, and an accountant. I never saw a holy guy with a bookkeeper. There were also a couple of second-rate American actresses. Alex was repulsed to see the Maharishi herding them into a group photo, like a class photo, which he would use for publicity. It was obvious that John was unquestionably in Maharishi's control. Despite the fact that John had been drug-free for more than a month and was in the best physical shape in years, Alex believed the guru was receiving more than he was giving. Only a week had passed since Alex had arrived at the camp when he learned that Maharishi wanted the Beatles to donate over 10 or 25% of their annual revenue to a Swiss account in his name. Alex reproved Maharishi for this, saying that his involvement with the Beatles was motivated by mercenary goals. According to Alex, the Maharishi made an effort to appease him by offering a powerful radio station on the ashram's property so that he could spread his spiritual message to the people of India. By the end of the 10th week, Alex was bent on undermining the Maharishi's influence. He started by sneaking wine into the complex. While John and George were writing songs late at night, Alex would serve the wine to the women. A lovely blonde nurse from California confessed that the Maharishi made sexual moves toward her during a private consultation with him during one of these late night, clandestine drinking sessions. Maharishi began by asking to hold her hand so that his spiritual power would flow between them. It soon developed that he had a more complicated but very old-fashioned method for facilitating the flow, if you know what I mean. On five separate occasions, eager to please the great teacher, the girl lay back, closed her eyes, and thought of California while the little guru ministered to her flesh. When Alex told them this, the other women were appalled. They believed that the Maharishi was a religious phony of particularly sleazy proportions. The entire night, John, George, and Alex sat up talking about it. George didn't believe a word of it, and he was furious with Alex. John had serious doubts. Maharishi had in fact proven to be just as materialistic and mercenary as the others. John had anticipated receiving a ticket to peace, but it turned out that the tiny LSD pills he took at home were ultimately more successful. The decision was made to leave early the next morning. Alex was worried that the Maharishi might refuse to assist them in finding transportation in an effort to block their way. Shortly after breakfast, the Maharishi entered the compound and took his place, cross-legged, under a little grass canopy. Cynthia could see he was far from giggling. The three men went up to see him. John had been elected as spokesman, although he hated the task. So, you know, there was a big hullabaloo about him raping Mia Farrow and all, trying to get off with Mia Farrow and a few other women and things like that. And we went down to him and we'd stayed up all night discussing was it true or not true, you know. And when George started thinking it might be true, well, I thought, well, it must be true because if George is doubting it, there must be something in it. So we went to see Maharaj. The whole gang was the next day charged down to his hut, you know, his bungalow, his very rich-looking bungalow in the, in the mountains. And... Uh, I, I was the spokesman. As usual, when the dirty work came, I actually had to be leader, whatever the scene was. When it came to the nitty-gritty, I had to do the speaking. And I said, uh, we're leaving. Why? <laughs> you know, all that shit. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, if you're so cosmic, you'll know why. 
you know, because he was always intimating, and there were all, all these, his right-hand men intimating that he did miracles, you know. And I said, you know why? You know? He said, I don't know why, you must tell me, and I just kept saying. And he gave me a look like, oh, I'll kill you bastard, he gave me such a look, and I knew then, when he looked at me, you know, because I'd called his bluff, I said, if you, if you know, you know all, you know, cosmic conscious, that's what we're all here for. The Maharishi had informed the residents of the nearby little town that the Beatles were not to be helped. The residents of the town explained to Alex that if they offered assistance, the Maharishi would place a curse on them. Finally, they were able to rent two old vehicles along with their drivers. Maharishi was watching them from the gates with sadness as they packed into the cars and drove off. Every few kilometers, the vehicles would break down and the tire on John and Cynthia's went flat. Everyone believed they had been cursed by the Maharishi. No spare tire was available, so John, Cynthia, and their driver stood along a barren road for more than three hours in the baking heat when two tourists recognized John and offered to pick them up while George and Patty drove ahead to seek assistance. When they finally arrived in Delhi, they were exhausted and enraged. They checked into the Hilton Airport, where they were recognized right away. Twenty minutes later, foreign correspondents and reporters were crowded around the hotel lobby, attempting to obtain a comment from the Beatles regarding their decision to leave the ashram. It was wisely decided that they wouldn't discuss what had happened while they were still in India. The Beatles made the decision to keep quiet about the incident once they were back in London. They came to the conclusion that if the whole tale were told, it would only reflect poorly on them. The story did eventually surface in fragments, but they were greatly distorted. In one account, Mia Farrow is wrongly identified as Maharishi's correspondent. Individually, the Beatles had predictable reactions to the Maharishi incident. George remained a believer and follower, while Ringo was benign. Paul was smug, in an I told you so kind of attitude. George was one of the many convinced that Alex was lying and trying to slander the Maharishi in order to get John away from him. John had the strongest reaction of all, he felt duped. For the millionth time, he felt abused, and he was furious. In a song about Maharishi, he let some of his rage out, but had to modify the title to Sexy Sadie to avoid legal trouble. Maharishi was added to his long collection of disappointments, and John was once again open and gullible for the next big thing to come. I don't know what yeah. level he's on, but uh, <laughs> he's on the we level. had a nice holiday in India and came back rested to play yeah. businessman. When Brian Epstein was alive, all the Beatles had to do was pick up the phone or sign a bill, and everything was paid for. They never gave a second thought to how much they spent or where it came from. With him gone, they were forced to confront a slew of hard facts. They were taxed at 96%. While their music publishing company, Northern Songs, provided John and Paul with some untaxed income, George and Ringo were poor in comparison. Everyone spent well beyond their means. According to documents prepared in June 1967, they had spent approximately 750,000 pounds on homes, cars, and luxury living. Because of the 1965 finance tax, they could no longer advance funds from their various companies without incurring an immediate tax liability. The tax expert's advice was straightforward. Expand. Invest in related businesses with real estate values and go public in four or five years. This was a solid, long-term strategy to ensure the Beatles' wealth as they aged. For the Beatles, however, the message was, spend. For several months, the Beatles considered starting a related business, but the word business had terrible connotations. Why couldn't business be enjoyable? Why can't business be called something catchy like Apple? According to the Beatles, Apple would be a place where business could be enjoyable. Apple Corps, a pun from Paul's, was formed from their old company, Beatles Limited. The formation of the new company included a crucial partnership agreement, which they all signed. As it turned out, John was so out of it at the time, he couldn't remember signing any partnership papers at all. The initial plan was to open a chain of record stores, not so much to sell records as to acquire valuable real estate for each store. However, selling records was deemed too commercial for the Beatles. Apple's design had to reflect the spirit of the times. It had to be something bigger a multifaceted source of endowment and funding for all forms of creativity. Music, filmmaking, publishing, design, and electronics. 
Apple, like the Beatles, became larger than life. On May 12, 1968, John and Paul traveled to New York to officially announce the birth of Apple. The trip was part of a five-day publicity blitz organized by Salters and Roskin, a public relations firm. It included a press conference, an Apple board meeting, a photo layout in Life magazine, and an appearance on The Tonight Show, which had an estimated audience of 25 million people. Johnny Carson, the show's regular host, was replaced by retired baseball player Joe Garagiola, which disappointed John and Paul. Garagiolo was a pleasant, straightforward guy who was obviously pleased to have the Beatles on his show, but was equally perplexed by what they were discussing. They were serious when they told him about their plans for Apple. It's just trying to mix business with enjoyment. Because we're in business, you know, we find ourselves in business. Are you, the directors? Make it, Are you the directors yeah, of this? Yeah, but yeah. like all the profits won't go into our pockets. They'll go to help people, but not like a charity. Garagiola grinned at them. He kept grinning as John spoke. It's a business concerning records, films, and electronics. And as a sideline, whatever it's called, manufacturing or whatever. But we want to set up a system whereby people who just want to make a film about anything don't have to go on their knees in somebody's office, probably yours. We should have had a big sign, you don't have to beg. The word spread throughout the world. Every dreamer, crook, rip-off artist, and phony entrepreneur realized the same thing. The Beatles were so wealthy, they were giving money away. All you had to do was show a plan to them, and they'd say, go away and do it. That night, John and Paul had no idea what they had unleashed. In July 1968, Apple relocated to new headquarters, more befitting its grandiose goals. The Beatles paid nearly 500,000 pounds for a five-story Georgian townhouse at 3 Savile Row in the heart of the custom tailoring district. This imposing brick structure was once a popular gambling club called the Albany, and it was rumored to have been Lady Hamilton and Lord Nelson's love nest. The Beatles, being the gamblers and lovers that they were, set about transforming the building into their new home. Each executive was given his or her own spacious office to decorate. Magic Alex set to work with a construction crew in the deep basement to build the Beatles' own private studios, complete with 78-track recording, as promised. There was also a stately wrought iron lift for executive use, and on the third floor, a well-equipped kitchen and pantry stocked with everything from bacon butters to caviar. At all hours of the day, two cordon blue chefs prepared an endless array of dishes, including ham and eggs for Ringo and roast leg of lamb for business lunches. The building's front was sandblasted and whitewashed, and a flagpole was installed to make it look like an embassy. A full-time footman bouncer dressed in a Tommy Netter frock coat was hired. On the front steps, in any weather and at any time of day, waited four girls known as the Apple Scruffs and immortalized in song by George. They stood vigil on those front steps as the weirds and wackies of the worlds descended upon them. In addition to John and Paul's erroneous proclamation on The Tonight Show, soliciting projects for Apple, a poster and newspaper campaign asking aspiring artists to bring their wares to Apple appeared that summer. Ellister Taylor was hired to appear in the commercial dressed as a busker or street musician. The headline stated, This man had talent. One day he sang his songs to a tape recorder, borrowed from the man next door, sent the tape, letter, and photograph. If you were thinking of doing the same thing yourself, do it now. This man now owns a Bentley. We just got inundated with tapes and poetry and scripts and phew. And in actual fact, I don't really think we got any bands or any artists by that method. It turned out that a lot of people wanted Bentleys and the majority of them showed up at three Savile Row. The list of people with schemes, plots, and plans is as long as it is astonishing at times. An American man wanted the Beatles to buy anonymously six square miles of Arizona land to hold a three-week rock and roll orgy attended by three million people to climax in a live performance by them. There was a man who had a pill formula that could turn you into whoever you wanted to be. There were several messiahs and one or two doomsday prophets. There were people who had seen flying saucers and God and required money to travel up, down, or in circles. <laughs> 
They were frequently stopped at Heathrow Airport for lack of funds or passports, and they simply gave John Lennon's or Paul McCartney's names as sponsors. A family of psychedelic California hippies practically moved into the Apple Building, claiming to be on their way to the Fiji Islands and requiring John's assistance in establishing a commune. The mother, a 40-ish woman named Emily, would happily breastfeed her youngest child in the reception area, while a half dozen other completely naked children ran from office to office. The proposals and schemes submitted to the office could fill a book on their own. They were stacked in a storage closet known as the Black Room. They all rang from England when, one morning, morning my time, and said, we're starting this company, Apple. So we went, we up to, went to live in um, Surrey, and I worked for Apple, became Apple press officer again. Derek Taylor was the only source of energy at 3 Savile Row. Derek was the best and worst choice of all the department heads in some ways. On the plus side, he was one of the few people who could encapsulate Apple's idealism. Derek was convinced of the Beatles' good intentions, and his enthusiasm was contagious. But Derek was a man with a strong addiction to alcohol and drugs at the time. He was the dispenser of Apple's good vibes as a kind of inebriated, psychedelic visionary, and the world saw Derek and his brand of inspired lunacy as Apple's best foot forward. It was hardly the best foot. He encouraged the kind of benevolent anarchy to develop. His specific responsibility was to deal with the press, which was a chore in and of itself, however, because no one in the organization could handle the collection of freaks who appeared in the entrance hallway, Derek took it upon himself to screen these people. He sat in a fantail wicker chair behind a large desk, cigarette or joint in hand, scotch and coke in front of him, greeting a never-ending stream of visitors. He dealt with the screwballs. If someone came in and announced himself as Napoleon, Derek might invite him up for a drink and inquire about France. Someone dubbed Stocky was given permission to sit on the file cabinets all day and draw pictures of genitalia. When a young donkey named Samantha was walked into the lift and sent up to Derek's office, the receptionist didn't even blink. There were persistent phone calls from someone in Los Angeles named Squeaky from wanting to speak with them about someone named Charles Manson. Derek's bushy-haired assistant, Richard DeLillo, began squirreling away notes and clipping about the Apple Madness for a hysterically funny book called, quite appropriately, The Longest Cocktail Party. A 15-day inventory of Derek's office supplies included 600 packs of Benson & Hedges cigarettes, 4 bottles of Courvoisier brandy, 3 bottles of vodka, 2 dozen ginger ale, 1 dozen tonic water, and so on. Ellister Taylor, the office manager, noted with relief that the provision list had shrunk. The previous one had included two cases of J&B scotch. At the start of Apple's life on Savile Row, the Beatles were very interested in the company, especially Paul, who acted like a kid with a new set of trains. He arrived at the office every morning for the first few months and went over details of running the company, including whether there was enough toilet paper in the bathroom. The record division was his personal pride and joy. Paul insisted on the company being a first-rate production. But people didn't do the same amount of work. You know, I, I think I lived in London, I was there more. So um, I probably did a little bit more production, for instance, than Ringo did. Um, I'm not sure what Ringo did, actually. I wasn't as involved as the others. Um, as I say, you know, it was fun, we'd go in and you know, a lot of what it did related to the four of us. As I say, John wanted to do stuff like Zapple. He wanted a sort of funky label that he could do crazy stuff on. So that became his area. With the newly acquired ability to create stars, almost everyone in the entourage believed he had discovered the next big pop star. Terry Doran signed Grapefruit, a group of teenagers who began working on an album. Badfinger, then known as the Ivies, were discovered by Mal Evans and signed on the basis of a demo tape and sent into the studios. Jackie Lomax, a singer from Liverpool, was signed by George. John signed a contract with a band called Contact, who performed a song called Lovers from the Sky about flying saucers. James Taylor, a young American boy, had been signed by Peter Asher. Asher had such faith in Taylor that he wanted to manage him as well. Paul had high hopes for Mary Hopkin, a 17-year-old Welsh singer. Twiggy, the model, had brought Hopkin to Paul's attention as the three-time winner of a TV talent show called Opportunity Knox. Paul's Hey Jude, backed by John's revolution, was the Beatles' personal contribution. 
The double A-side single became one of England's best-selling singles in 20 years. The Beatles' new double album was no less successful in its own right. The White Album was indeed a work of art. It took them an unprecedented five months to record and mix the 30 songs on the two-disc set. On December 4th, when employees at Apple's headquarters were getting ready for the holidays, George made the decision to pull off the most unsettling of shocks. George met members of the notorious Hell's Angels Motorcycle Club while he was residing in Los Angeles, producing music for Jackie Lomax's debut album. Neil Aspinall explained George Harrison's informal accommodation offer to the Hell's Angels. Well, George said it was all right. These guys stated as they rode the motorcycles along Savile Row a few months later. They eventually settled at Apple, where they terrorized everyone. George claims that despite the Beatle pinning the following memo, Hell's Angels will be in London next week. On their way to straighten out Czechoslovakia, Apple personnel were unaware of the biker gang's impending arrival. There will be 12 of them, riding motorcycles and wearing black leather jackets. They'll undoubtedly make it to Apple, and from what I've heard, they might try to utilize all of its resources. Don't be terrified of them, although they could seem to be after you, they are actually pretty honest and do good actions. Try to help them, but don't let them take over Savile Row. The gang's presence stopped all activity at Apple. As the group marched past the exposed gold records on the walls and into the press office, where I was waiting with Derek Taylor, the staff members gathered in doors and corners and tried not to stare. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, I'm sure, I said after a moment of mild horror before quickly leaving the room. I would arrive and find the Hells Angels sitting around on the floor doing those physical things they performed, a lot of scratching and farting and overall being terrible. They were known as the California Pleasure Crew by the personnel. Derek was dealing with far more important issues. He had slightly overstepped his responsibilities a few months before by promising a monthly magazine that he would obtain an original recorded message from John and Yoko. This message was to be printed on a flimsy, which was a pliable plastic record that could be stapled into the magazine. The message's text was to be a plea for world peace and the end of the Vietnam War. However, Derek was unable to contact John during the fall when the recording should have been completed. It was soon the beginning of December, and the magazine had been advertising the flimsy for a month with no message. The magazine's lawyers had already called Peter Brown and threatened him with a costly lawsuit. John finally answered the phone after Derek practically begged the household staff. Derek explained the situation and the importance of recording a simple message, even if it was over the phone. John sounded exhausted and high. I've got a recording for you, he said to Derek. Have someone come here and get it. Derek invited the magazine editors and their lawyers to three Savile Row a few days later. Derek directed them to a row of chairs in front of large, studio-quality speakers. This is John and Yoko's contribution for a Christmas message, he said, before playing a tape. The sound of a baby's heartbeat grew fainter and weaker until it slowed to silence filled the room. And then the baby died, Derek explained. The magazine staff was stunned. This has to be some kind of monstrous joke. One of them commented. No, it's not a joke, Derek clarified. It's one of a kind, authentic, and completely free. The magazine sued Apple for monetary damages, and the case was eventually settled out of court. Trying to control Apple's spending was like riding on the back of a tiger. It's difficult to hold on, but if you let go, the tiger runs around and eats you. It wouldn't have been so bad if Apple had turned into a three-ring circus, if there had been a ringmaster to oversee the proceedings. However, because there was no ultimate authority to control the cash flow, money was simply pissed away. The liquor kept flowing, as did the Cordon Blue Chef's fancy lunches. So far, Magic Alex had produced nothing of value. Promotional records were disappearing at an alarming rate, only to be sold on the black market to unscrupulous record stores. Television sets vanished through the front door, as did the occasional paid packet left on the desk of a trusting soul. Stephen Maltz, the young staff accountant who had resigned the previous October 1968 in protest of the Beatles' handling of their finances, had already brought the vast expenditures to the Beatles' attention. Maltz wrote in a letter to each of the Beatles. After six years' work, for the most part of which you have been at the very top of the musical world, in which you have given pleasure to countless millions throughout every country where records are played, what have you got to show for it? <laughs>
Your personal finances are a mess. Apple is a mess. Thus began the ill-fated search for a new CEO at Apple. If Apple needed a CEO, Paul reasoned they should get the biggest one of all. That was Lord Beeching in Paul's mind. His Beeching Axe was responsible for the consolidation and financial health of British Railways, but he declined right away. They then approached Lord Poole, chairman of Lazard's bank, who offered to handle Apple's finances for free without becoming officially involved. However, Paul quickly lost interest in the generous banker and never returned his call. The visionary who founded Radio Caroline, Ronan O'Reilly, was invited to a meeting at Apple to discuss the possibility of him becoming involved, but he was voted down. Some donkey named Caleb, a former salesman at the Apple boutique, consulted the I Ching and determined that he didn't have, quote, the right vibes. Caleb and his pickup sticks were being consulted so frequently that he was making just as many important decisions as anyone else. We haven't half the money people think we have, we're losing money. If it carries on like this, we'll be broke in six months, declared John on January 18th, putting his business in Fleet Street. John's financial SOS was not taken serious, nor it is any wonder. For years, the press had been detailing the financial triumphs of the Beatles, with the result that the Fab Four were presumed to be the wealthiest young men in the world. In terms of gross income, the estimate was accurate. As of December 1968, the Beatles had earned $154 million. Yet John had not exaggerated, the Beatles were virtually broke. The only man who read John's distress signal correctly was Alan Klein. They might have been exciting for everybody else and for people that came in from the outside. For me, it was um, a lot of hard work setting it up and uh, a lot of chaos. I was still in India when it started. I think it was basically um, John and Paul's uh, madness, uh, ego, running away with themselves or with each other. We were just guys goofing off, having a lot of fun, um, trying to get things under our control. That was basically what we were trying to do, which a lot of people do now. They have their own companies, they, they, they take lawyers to meetings and get good deals and things, you know. It was the start of all of that, but it was a pretty haphazard start. You know, I mean, it had a lot of ideas of we could do this and we could do that, but when it came down to it, really, the only thing we could do was write songs and make records and be Beatles. After many failed attempts to find a new CEO for Apple Corps, Paul realized he had the perfect big daddy right under his nose. Lee Eastman, the father of his fiancée Linda. Lee was a sound and conservative lawyer whose legal background in the music business had been with the big bands, including Tommy Dorsey. But Paul's suggestion was met with groans of disbelief. Paul was informed that he was mistaken if he thought he was not only going to run the group musically, but also arrange for the financial management to be taken over by someone who seemed likely to be his future father-in-law. Paul dug in at this challenge and insisted that they should at least hear what Eastman had to say. Lee Eastman misjudged the importance of this meeting and instead sent John Eastman, his 28-year-old son, and partner in his law firm. John reeked of urban sophistication and old money. He represented what Paul aspired to himself and at the same time, everything that would turn the Beatles off. John's legal advice, however, was first class and intelligent. He suggested that the very first thing to do was buy NIMS Enterprises, Brian Epstein's old musical act management company. Clive Epstein, Brian's brother, was desperate to get the company off his hands. John pointed out that NIMS continued to deduct a whopping 25% income from their recording royalties. Indeed, NIMS was entitled to collect their earnings for nine more years, as explained previously in a deal negotiated by Brian Epstein. Clive Epstein had put the word out in the city that NIMS and its 25% cut of the Beatles was for sale. Leonard Richenberg, the aggressive managing director, offered £1 million for it. Clive reported this offer to the Beatles. If they wanted to match it, NIMS was theirs. All they needed was the money. We need an immediate cash advance against royalties for £1 million, John Eastman explained. It was just at this moment that Alan Klein arrived on the scene. We haven't half the money people think we have, we're losing money. 
If it carries on like this, we'll be broke in six months. While most dismissed the statement as typical John hyperbole, Klein recognized it as a signal that his services were needed. Klein unleashed a barrage of phone calls to Apple. He insisted that he would only speak to one person, John Lennon. Unbeknownst to the other Beatles, John and Yoko went to meet with Klein in his suite that very night. John and Yoko liked him right away. He was bigger than life. He talked loudly in grandiose generalizations, and with a New York Jewish accent that made John Scouse sound like the King's English. Just like John, he was an orphan who lived with his aunt, and in some ways, Klein had many of the same ethnic elements as a Liverpudlian. He was blunt and common. Numbers added, subtracted, and divided magically in his computer-like mind. This kind of crass honesty appealed to Yoko too, who admired Klein as one street fighter does another. Most of all, they were impressed by Klein's appreciation of their art. He was able to quote every song of John's body of work. This left John feeling greatly praised and slightly soft-headed, a bit of putty in Klein's hands. You should be rich, he said. Let me make a lot of money for you. Klein promised John and Yoko that he would renegotiate for the Beatles a much higher percentage of royalties from EMI, plus a huge cash advance that would solve all their problems. On top of that, he promised to get NIMS for them for free. Before John and Yoko even left Klein's suite, John wrote, From now on, Alan Klein handles all my stuff. Now the war began in earnest. As John later admitted, he wanted somebody to go after Paul and the Eastman family for him, and Klein obliged him with a vengeance. John insisted that the Beatles should meet with Klein. George and Ringo arrived with John and Yoko, while Paul arrived with John Eastman. Klein started the meeting by telling them that they should hold off buying NIMS until he had finished an audit of their books. He said that John's idea to buy it for a million pounds was, quote, a piece of crap, calling him a fool. Eastman gritted his teeth and didn't answer, but when he went to the bathroom, he emerged holding a glass jar full of suppositories left there by Klein. I thought you were the perfect asshole, Eastman said. Paul and John left the meeting early. Once Klein was alone with George and Ringo, he was able to say all they wanted to hear. At this point, Lee Eastman decided to fly to London and have a meeting with the Beatles and Klein. The proceedings got off to a roaring start. Klein had done some research on Lee Eastman and had turned up the information that his name had been changed from, of all things, Epstein. Klein also armed John with this intelligence, and throughout the meeting, the two of them referred to Eastman as Epstein. Lee remained calm in the face of that affront, but was unable to contain himself when Klein began interrupting everything he said. Finally, Eastman leapt out of his chair and got into a childish screaming match with Klein. He lost the battle at this moment. Unable to make a counteroffer in time, due to Klein in the Eastman's petty battle, Clive Epstein sold NIMS to Leonard Richenberg. The Beatles were stunned that they had lost NIMS, and a finger-pointing and name-calling match ensued. Suddenly, there were three Beatles behind Klein, and the cracks in the group became even more apparent. John was lying in bed in Amsterdam one day with Yoko, during one of his infamous bed-ins for peace, when he came across an article that said Dick James, the Beatles' longtime music publisher, was selling all of his 37% of Northern Song stock to Sir Lou Grade at ATV. The Beatles were shocked. How could Dick James, the Beatles' sweet cigar-smoking uncle, sell out Northern Songs without first informing them? To John and Paul, Northern wasn't just a collection of 159 compositions, it was their child. And selling it to Sir Lou Grade was like putting their child into an orphanage. But Dick James saw the writing on the wall. The Beatles were a ticking time bomb, and it was written in Klein's handwriting. James knew the value of Northern songs depended on the willingness of Lennon and McCartney to work together. John and Paul had already refused to sign an extension on their songwriting contract with Northern, and James had good reason to doubt the longevity of their relationship. And indeed, the cracks had been visible for quite some time. The White Album, as wonderful as it was, was almost a collection of solo recordings. During those sessions, Ringo left the band, and George left during Get Back. John did not perform on several tracks on their upcoming album, Abbey Road. The number of blunders was mounting, 
and rumors of the band's impending split were spreading. Yet James might have stuck it out if it hadn't been for the injection of Klein into the already volatile situation. This was clearly the time to abandon ship. Again, the Beatles rode into financial battle. On April 11, 1969, the Beatles formally announced their plan to fight the ATV bid with a substantial counteroffer. It was that detail that put the final nail between John and Paul. In order to raise the money for the counteroffer, John and Paul would up their shares in Northern as collateral. But under the Eastman's advice, Paul refused to put up his stock. At first, Paul said it was too risky until the real reason surfaced. When the Beatles' Northern stock holdings were tallied, it was discovered that Paul had 751,000 shares versus John's 644,000. Paul had been purchasing shares secretly in his own name, unbeknownst to the other three Beatles. You bastard, John said. You've been buying up stock behind our backs. Paul blushed and shrugged limply. This is fucking low. This is the first time any of us have gone behind each other's backs. Paul shrugged again. I felt like I had some beanies and I wanted some more. With some additional machinations and business details, the deal dragged on until October when it was finally closed. It was all over now. John and Paul had lost their child. To pour salt in the wound, ATV appointed Dick James to sit on the board of directors. Despite the fact that their kingdom was crumbling down around them and despite almost unbearable acrimony among them as a group, Paul had managed to assemble all the weary Beatles into the studios for one last hurrah. The summer of 1969 was the last big whimper of the 60s. That summer summed up all we had learned and all our dashed dreams. Half a million disciples of the rock generation assembled in Woodstock for a three-day celebration of music and love. U.S. astronaut Neil Armstrong became the first man on the moon. Brian Jones, the former member of the Rolling Stones, was found floating dead in his swimming pool, bloated with barbiturates and booze. In Los Angeles, Charles Manson and his gang of lunatics slashed their way into infamy with the Tate LaBianca murders. That summer was also a turning point for John. Elated over the performance in the Toronto Rock and Roll Festival in Canada, he remembered the thrill of performing live again, and this time, the speaker systems were advanced enough to be heard. He was so happy with the experience that on the plane ride home, he decided he was going to formally announce to the press that he was leaving the Beatles and starting his own band with Eric Clapton and Klaus Wurman. Klein, who had joined John and Yoko in Toronto for the plane ride back to London, dissuaded him from this. The new recording contracts Klein had renegotiated for the Beatles with EMI and Capital weren't in effect just yet, and the huge advances hadn't all been paid. But that didn't keep John from enjoying the satisfaction of telling Paul. Shortly after John's return from Toronto, he demanded a meeting at Apple. Paul arrived, his usual magnanimous self, full of plans for new Beatles projects. But no matter what Paul suggested, John kept saying no. The discussion finally dissolved into a mean argument, which Paul finally recovered from by launching into one of his Beatle pep talks. When everything is said and done, we're still the Beatles, aren't we? Ah, oh, fuck. I ain't no Beatle. Of course you are. No, I'm not. Don't you understand? It's over. I want a divorce, just like the divorce I got from Cynthia. The meeting ended shortly after, with John rushing down the stairs, Yoko behind him, shouting, It's over! 